Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be visiting Ireland in the 1970s and 1980s to look at the life of Shergar. Shergar was a thoroughbred bay colt who was foaled on the 3rd of March 1978 at Sheshun in Ireland. Sheshun is the oldest stud farm in Ireland and is owned by the Aga Khan family. In 1979, Shergar was sent to Newmarket in England to be trained by Michael Stout. Michael was an extremely successful thoroughbred horse trainer. Shergar was reportedly easy to train with a good temperament. In Shergar's first race, on 19th of September 1980, he was ridden by Lester Piggott, widely regarded as one of the best flat race jockeys of all time. Shergar won the race by two and a half lengths, and this was the start of a short but illustrious career for him. In the 1981 racing season, his trainer, Michael Stout, wanted Shergar to run in the Epsom Derby, with earlier races that season targeted to prepare him for this. With the early races resulting in wins, Shergar's odds of winning the Derby became increasingly shorter and by the day of the race, he was the strong favourite to win. This time he was ridden by jockey Walter Swinburne. Shergar charged the victory, winning the derby with ease. He finished over 10 lengths ahead of the second place horse, the longest winning margin in the derby's history. This win led to many hailing Shergar as the greatest racehorse of all time. Four more major wins during the 1981 season led to him becoming European Horse of the Year. He was retired from racing following a disappointing and unexplained performance at the St Ledger Stakes on the 12th of September 1981. Despite huge offers to move Shergar to the United States of America and put him to stud, the Aga Khan wanted him to remain in Ireland. Shergar was syndicated for £10 million, a record price at the time, with 40 shares each valued at £250,000. The Aga Khan retained six shares for himself and the remaining 34 were sold individually to buyers from around the world. In October 1981, Shergar arrived at the Ballymany Stud in Ireland. He was paraded down the main street of Newbridge, County Kildare, having become one of the most recognisable sports icons in Ireland at that time. At Ballymany Stud, Shergar was put into the care of the head groom, 58-year-old Jim Fitzgerald and his team. In the 1982 season, Shergar covered 44 mares, from which 36 foals were produced. On Tuesday, the 15th of June, 1982, while being ridden by a stable hand, Shergar threw the rider, ran through a hedge and out onto a road. He then trotted along to a village over five miles away where he was spotted by a resident who managed to grab hold of Shergar and lead him back to the stables. Fortunately, he was unharmed during this incident. At the beginning of 1983, five-year-old Shergar's second stud was due to begin with expected earnings of around £1 million for that season alone. At approximately 8.30pm on the 8th of February 1983, Jim Fitzgerald was relaxing with his wife and children after dinner when there was a knock at the front door. Two armed, masked men forced their way into Jim's house, stating that they had come for Shergar. The security at the Ballymany stud, as was quite common practice at the time, was virtually non-existent. Quite shocking when considering the value of the horses that resided there. The men locked Jim's wife and children inside a room in the house before taking Jim at gunpoint to Shergar's stable. Jim was instructed to load Shergar into the horse box which the men had brought with them. Jim was then forced at gunpoint into a separate van and told to lie face down on the floor. After being in the van for approximately four hours, Jim was released unharmed near the village of Kilcock, approximately 20 miles away from where the journey had started. As Jim was let go, he was told that the thieves would be demanding a £2 million ransom for Shergar's safe return 
and would use the code words of King Neptune to identify themselves. Jim was told not to contact the police, otherwise his family would be killed. He should wait to hear from the thieves with further instructions. Jim walked into the village where he called his brother to collect him. Terrified of contacting the police due to the threat to his family, there followed a series of phone calls between shareholders, Shergal's vet, racing associates and Irish ministers. By the time the Aga Khan had been contacted about the theft, Shergal had already been missing for almost eight hours. Upon the Aga Khan's instructions, the police were finally informed of the theft, but by this point the thieves had a head start of over eight hours. The investigation was further complicated by the fact that there was a big racehorse sale taking place that day, so many horse boxes were on the road. It was collectively, though not unanimously, decided by the syndicate that any ransom demands would not be met. It was felt that, if the ransom was paid, it would make every high-value horse in Ireland and throughout the world a target for future thefts, while still not guaranteeing the safe return of Shergar. A series of calls were received, during which the caller stated they would only negotiate with three horse racing journalists, Derek Thompson, or Tomo, and John Oaksey of the TV channel ITV, and Peter Campling from The Sun newspaper. The three men were brought to the Europa Hotel in Belfast, at the time this was known for being the most bombed in Europe, due to suffering multiple bomb attacks during the Northern Ireland conflict. This however turned out to be an elaborate hoax. While this was distracting the eyes of the press, the real negotiations were continuing behind closed doors. Using the code word King Neptune, the thieves made a number of calls over the next couple of days where they demanded £2 million in ransom money. After negotiation, a proof of life photograph showing Shergar alongside a copy of the Irish News dated the 11th of February was provided. When this proof of life photograph was questioned by the negotiators, due to it only including some of Shergar's head, the thieves were unimpressed. The caller stated that if you are not satisfied, that's it. The call ended and the thieves made no further contact. Despite attempts from negotiators to re-establish communications, they were never heard from again. The police search for Shergar ended in May 1983 and no trace of him has ever been found. Despite being valued at around £10 million, Shergar was only insured for about £8 million, as it was down to each member of the syndicate to insure their own share individually. In June 1983, Lloyds of London paid out £7 million in claims, with a further £1 million which would be paid if Shergar's remains were found prior to the policies expiring. No one has ever been charged, convicted or admitted any involvement in the crime, and it would seem that we would never know exactly what happened following the theft of Shergar. However, many years later, a credible version of events has been pieced together about Shergar's final days. It is now widely believed that the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA, took Shergar that night. However, this group of thieves had little to no experience of dealing with horses and were ill-equipped to handle this thoroughbred stallion. They were also presumably unaware of the complexities of dealing with a ransom negotiation, particularly with a worldwide syndicate of 35 people involved. With no chance of a payoff for their crime, according to a former IRA member, Shergar was then machine gunned to death and dumped in either a bog in County Leitrim or in the sea. Whilst we will never be entirely certain of the exact sequence of events that followed the theft of Shergar on the 8th of February 1983, it is generally believed that this beautiful animal was shot to death, resulting in his name being remembered in history due to this horrific death rather than his racing legacy. That concludes today's story. Please add any comments down below. Please let me know if you've got any theories on what happened. On the Marlene Olive story that we released on Saturday, after about 11 or 12,000 views, had a comment from Ali Sam. 
It took a lot for Arlie to comment how she did, and I've actually pinned it as a post now, should you wish to see it, but I'm also gonna read it out. Arlette has only recently felt able to talk about this, and she confirmed it was okay for me to read it. I felt that everyone as part of the Crime Real family may wish to know about it and even offer support. Okay, time to share a horrible event from my past. It was Saturday morning, my favorite day of the week, my brother and sister and I were in the kitchen with our mum, in brackets, rest in peace. Anyway, an older cousin came to visit us. Now even though I was very little, I'm very self-aware, I noticed while he was talking to my mum, his clothes were on the wrong side and I thought that was odd. My mum was laughing and chatting with him and told us to go outside and play, in brackets, I wished I hadn't. We have cousins that live next door to us, so we went over to their house to play a while. While we were there, we heard a horrible screaming. Someone screaming murder in a very terrified voice. None of us knew who it was, and we ran home. We live on a hill, so when we came home, I saw my mom running down that hill as fast as she can, blood running down her face, and my cousin running behind her with a kitchen knife. I was literally paralyzed in shock hearing her. Our other neighbours arrived on the scene. Someone called an ambulance and my cousin ran off. I thought my mum had died. I was so terrified, I started crying and my sister told me what was I crying for. So I stopped. We stayed with our aunt till my mum came home. I was so happy to see her and glad she hadn't died. I hugged her. I could smell the horrible smell of blood on her face, but I didn't care. My mum was alive. I don't know much after that, but I got to find out my cousin was on drugs and must have tripped. He even went after other family members to kill them. He even tried to come after us at school, but he didn't know our names as we only used nicknames most of the time. My dad, in brackets, rest in peace, was sailing at the time and he came back. He went after my cousin. I don't know what he said to him, but he never bothered us again. Also, he was taken to a mental institute and died there from cancer. His name was Rohan. Because of that day, I've become extremely protective of the ones I love. So traumatized was I, and still am of what happened. I pushed it at the back of my mind. Only recently have I been able to speak of it. I know there are people out there who've been through much worse than I, and my heart goes out to them. Happy weekend, everyone. Thanks very much for that, Arlette. And now it's time for petty crime. Just so you're aware, if you ever want to send in pictures, please email them to thecrimereel at gmail.com. This first one comes in from Julia, who's in South Korea. Dear Crime Reel, I just wanted to share the kids who help us with the hunter killer sleuthing cases, and they also enjoy your videos. First up, we have Vlad the Impaler, beautiful cat. And then we have Emperor Nero, who is the bunny. Thanks ever so much for sending them in, Julia. And then next up, we have Miser, M-E-I-Z-E-R. It's been sent in by Miji Yoon. Miji is a great nature photographer and has sent pictures in before. The eyes have not been photoshopped. They are genuinely like that. She's a bit of a bully who picks fights with her three roommates. She attacks Miji's broom. If Miji pushes her along the floor with it gently, she gets even more mad, growling and complaining about it. She is, of course, a rescue. The first photo in the pink chair is not long after she was rescued a few years ago. The one on the staircase was taken a few weeks ago. Thanks again, Midgey, for sending them in. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, just wanted to say heartfelt thanks to you all. You pusters came out of the woodwork and helped me out by commenting the word last week. I'm so grateful to you all. I think today we've had about 1,850 comments. Amazing. Thanks for your support. Goodbye.